Give and go folks, I'm happy to announce that we finally have our very own Patreon. If you've been looking for a way to support the channel, if you've been looking for a way to just continue talking football, but on an extra level, then our Patreon is the perfect place to go to. Just $5 a month and to start, we have this Argentina trip coming up and we will be posting a lot of clips, including Saltero kissing the soil on there first before we post it here on YouTube or on our social media outlets. So, so right off the bat, you get a little bit of that extra benefit just by joining our Patreon. And beyond that, we'll offer a lot of other benefits that you'll see listed on the website, guys. So for now, if you'd like to support the show in any sort of way, we really appreciate it. And you can do it through our Patreon. Thank you so much, guys. And back to the show. Hello, and welcome back to The Give and Go. I'm your co-host, Reynoso, here with my boy, Soltero. What's up, guys? Did this man hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Did this man hurt you today? That's why I'm drinking, bro. <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes you have a really bad weekend in football, and it just doesn't work out. Yeah. And this is definitely that week. I mean, we'll get into it. Houston lost this weekend. Leon lost this weekend. And now my very beautiful Atletico lost mm -hmm. on the road in Barcelona to, you know, FC Barcelona. And uh, let, let's just get right into let's it. Let's get right into let's it. People want right to know your reaction, yeah, let, yeah, dude. Let's just get right into what it. What was um, it like? <laughs> seeing felix chip o block what do you mean <laughs> fuck you dude i didn't say shit bro i didn't finish the sentence but what was it like it was a really bad game for atletico dude. really poor performance all around um we were just kind of chasing the ball nothing worked for us but it was mainly just because barcelona had all the possession and they were moving the ball mm -hmm. way quicker mm -hmm. than we were and, you know, we got some stops, but low-key, bro, the score should have been 3-0 yep. by, like, the 20th minute. Yep. Lewandowski missed a couple of sitters. Rafinha missed a really easy shot game. one minute yep. into the game. And that honestly was the f foreshadowing of what this whole game was going to be like. Just Barcelona getting chance after chance, missing chance after chance, and Atletico really doing nothing. So, so you think Barca caused Atletico to play that rather than Atletico doing that to the themselves no i i think it's a mix of both it, it seemed out of character for me what happened to yeah them. yeah atletico looked off we looked really yeah. off it, honestly we looked really tired we didn't close down the space like we usually do my first thought was i was like dang this definitely felt like we're coming back from feyenoord mm -hmm. after having a really good win on the road from a really big champions league game night and now we have to play at the weekend and we just don't have that same type of energy but i don't want to really use that as an excuse because barcelona really showed up today and they cooked us we okay. got Cooked. It was their best, at least that first half, the best half I've seen from them this season. Yeah. Completely outplaying Atletico. And you could just see that pep and those players' steps in that first 45 minutes. So credit to Barcelona. And if it wasn't for Leva, you know, kind of falling out of form and really losing sight of what's in front of him, which is the goal, and Rafinha just being questionable in front of it as well, this could have been a much more different score. Yeah, but it... <sighs> What's really crazy about this result is it it kind of showed it kind of showed the bad sides of both teams. So for Atletico, it's just a really really poor performance, which is kind of worrying because when we need to play against the top quality type of teams, especially hopefully later on in the Champions League knockout stage, can we really show up? That's what I was more worried about after getting this result because dude, we did not show up at all and. It was completely signified by the second half changes that Simeone made. Dude, by the 65th minute, all five substitutes. He changed half the team. And we had a better spell after mm -hmm. that, for sure. Depay was a little bit more involved. Correa kind of was too. But Almost scored that free kick banger, though. Yeah, that would have been crazy. Yeah, insane yeah. stop by Iñaki Peña, yeah. by the way. It was just a beautiful shot, a really good stop, by the way. But at, at the end of the day, Atletico still just didn't do enough. And then for Barcelona, too, they've had this same exact problem all season long, and it's that they're not clinical enough. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they they don't finish the chances that they create. And in every game, every La Liga game, even if they do get the result, they leave the window open for their opponent to get back in the game. If Atletico had been able to find a way to, you know, 
up their energy in that second half, we would have equalized and maybe even gone on to win it, but we just could not find it. And for Barcelona, they, that window of opportunity should have never existed if they were just clinical in the first 30 minutes of this game because they absolutely killed Atletico for the first half. And But that's been Barcelona this whole season. They're amazing in spells, but over 90 minutes, pretty wasteful. Yeah, this was, a, this was an important game in the title race because... Girona won, Real Madrid won. Now Barcelona gets this massive, massive victory. I'm interested to see what the reception is for Joao Felix when he comes to the Wanda. I want to see what that's like, given the context of his build-up to that game now, being that he scored the game-winning goal in this match. What does that look like? And then also, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of this until today, Simeone yet, yet to win a game at Camp Nou. That's, yeah, that's damn. That's that's harsh. Like that's really incredible. Honestly, from Barca's perspective, they found a way to completely shut down Simeone in those Camp New matchups. I hate playing against Barcelona. They, it, I always get super super nervous because I never know what's going to happen. I think it's that history. You almost prefer Madrid then, Real oh, Madrid. One hundred percent. I just always feel like we're also more fired up for Madrid games. Mm -hmm. And when we do play Barcelona, for some reason, Barcelona mm -hmm. just they get us every every single time god dude but the, the thing is the one that got you today was that little fucking rascal man that little <laughs> traitor that left just at the beginning of the season and talked all that shit was the one to get you hey cheers to that brother drink up a little uh, bit but at the same up. time very very just he's annoying bro he's an annoying little brat from an Atletico Madrid perspective the kid's annoying he's <laughs> annoying but here's what's crazy we still own him and so at the end of the day he's gonna make us a lot of money he's gonna make so he's like he's, an, he's annoying for sure but we're gonna hopefully invest that money into someone who will appreciate it so I'm, I'm okay with it at the end of the day sure get the goal against us I don't mind enjoy it Felix enjoy okay. it alright all right, all right. I'm just saying remember this moment remember this moment then because God, dude, it's just crazy the soccer we've gone through with Joao Felix ever since he arrived and put on that jersey. He had a great game today. I want to make that very clear. He was incredibly active. His first touch was sublime in almost every reception that he had of the ball. Frankie de Jong was also fantastic today. Uh, Pedri. Pedri, Pedri was, yeah, was good. He was good. I think he's still trying to get, in, trying to get into it for sure. I think for Barcelona, though, just to t talk about them a little bit more, they definitely lack in that right back position with Koundé not being offensive like whatsoever. I think that's going to be a misstep for them, especially if they want to be more successful in like the Champions League setting. And then I, I've been saying this since the beginning of the season. I still fully believe this. I think Gundogan isn't maximized at Barcelona. Like he's there and he puts in some good balls from time to time. But I think more so Frankie de Jong is the guy in the midfield. And I think that actually puts Gundogan off from being a lot more impactful. Now, obviously, you'd still rather have him on the pitch, but I just think Gundogan doesn't get as involved uh, with his Barcelona team. But overall, an insane performance from pretty much every Barcelona player. A little wasteful, but they did get the result today, and they completely deserved yeah. it. I'm curious to see what happens this uh, winter transfer window because they have Victor Roque coming in now in January to join the team. And Leva is literally leaving the door open for him to actually get opportunities. Once there's someone to actually challenge Leva for their, that striker position, I wonder if by you know two, three months from now, if we're consistently seeing Vitor Roque actually get starts in La Liga in an important game for Barcelona because... If, Le if Lewandowski continues at this rate, I think it's worth switching up and trying something different. Dude, on honestly, great point because Leva could not figure it out today. He had chance after chance and he just either couldn't get the first touch right, makes the wrong decision, or just straight up fluffed his chance. Mm -hmm. Leva was pretty poor today, actually. But uh, yeah, that, that's really, really interesting. Interesting. Keep an yeah, eye on keep that. Keep an eye on it. I saw that it's, what, Lewandowski's worst scoring up until December since like 2014. Really? really? So he's been here before, but obviously he's way older now. Yeah. So the, yeah. that's a definite concern for Barcelona going forward. La Liguilla is in full effect now um <laughs> chivas facing off against pumas allow me to go off for five minutes oh, yeah, if you please. don't mind let me just get this off my chest i haven't spoken much about chivas this season specifically could be a credit to a number of things heartbreak that i still think about from what happened last season where we lost in that final after a crazy comeback from tigres it could be also just how involved we've been watching other leagues mm -hmm. as well, talking about other football outside of Chivas. But a big factor too is that I've only spoken about them once when Alexis Vega and Chicote Calderon were supposedly suspended from this team and Banovic was 
looking like he was about to leave the squad as well to go to Almeria. Mm -hmm. That's the one time I chose to speak about in this entire season. And when I did, I made a point to say that I don't see this Chivas team being an actual threat to lift the trophy this year. At least in that moment, I didn't see it. Despite them being a top six team in Liga and Mekis, the way they were playing was just lacking that extra punch that we had last year. Last year, we had a a team vigor uh, yeah. that, that was felt across the country that got so many Chivas fans on board on their way to the final that I think was notable. It, it, was, it was visible. You could see it. And this year, it was really good, but I, it just, I think something wasn't there. And I don't know what to pinpoint it. I don't, know, I don't know what it is. Was it the fact that we didn't have Alexis Vega for a full season and he wasn't fully involved with the team? Was it the inclusion of Eddie Gutierrez, which has been kind of shaky so far? What could it be? What was specifically the one thing? I don't know. But all I know is that I just didn't feel it this year with Chivas. I really didn't. The thing is, when the Ligia comes around, you find a way to convince yourself that you do have a shot that you do have a chance. And then Liga Meki specifically has a way of tricking you. It tricks you, bro. Because after one leg, you're looking really good. Mm -hmm. you're, feeling really, you're feeling really good about yourself. And more specifically, Chivas absolutely dominating Pumas in El Acron. In a game that should have be, been 1-2-0, 3-0. Got unlucky with some of our finishing. Hit the post on a couple occasions. But overall, Chivas still wins the match 1-0. And I was feeling myself that night. I even went out and got a cigar, if you remember correctly, mm -hmm, man. Mm -hmm. I felt good. I was feeling really good. And I was starting to feel that magic once again. But in order for me to fully, fully commit to that feeling, I needed to see us get a result today. Away from home, in Pumasa Stadium, I needed to see us get a result as the lower seed. <laughs> That magic was gone within 20 minutes, brother. Yeah, yeah, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, bro. Yeah. Quick. Stopped watching the game after the 60th minute, bro. Got on YouTube instead. Yeah, that was that, the right decision. That type of game, dude. Yeah. Chino Huerta with one of the craziest vengeance stories. <laughs> uh, it's fucking like a storybook vengeance story here and making this game hella personal. <laughs> Taking his shirt off and showcasing his shirt underneath that said, Re hecho en el CU which is to say that he was uh, it's actually an ode to what uh, Jaime Lozano once did when he was with Pumas. He wore the same exact shirt underneath. Oh, no way? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so it was it an was ode a... to that. Oh, shit. And then on top of that, Huerta played with Chivas. Yeah. Chivas essentially sold him off in a swap deal for Alan Mosso, the ex-Pumas player who caused a foul today. Mm -hmm. And Chino Huerta has had an incredible season so far, making it to the national team and yeah. just playing completely lights out. Good for him, happy for him, actually, on a national level, but at the club level, just going off and making it personal as he gets one goal for sure with a penalty and then, this, then, then another one that was a non-goal from Briseño but could have been caused by Chino Huerta, you decide. Overall, Chino Huerta completely shut the door on Chivas having any sort of hope of winning this match. And once he got that second goal, it was over for me, bro. Over. The dream is dead. On to next season. Let's see what else we can do. But that's all I have to say, man. Bumas took over at home. They delivered. They played like the fourth seed that they are today. And we were able to shut down Huerta in that first match. But when you're not able to do that, bro, and he's feeling himself, you get this. You get a match where Pumas just completely dominates and ends your title chances within 60 minutes. Congrats to Pumas. Congrats to any Pumas fans out there. And for my Chivas fans, at the very least, this wasn't in a heartbreaking fashion. I'm actually kind of grateful for that. Yeah. I'd rather lose like this, man, because this shit does not hurt at all. If anything, I'm just like, yeah, let's put it close to it. Let's put a pin on it and let's move on. Yeah, you know what's funny about this match is that if you play this game again, Chivas actually might win it. Uh, Chivas didn't play <sighs> that badly. And if you think about the two goals that ended it, pretty lucky from a Pumas perspective. The first one, an own goal, right? That's luck, uh, definitely. And the second one, clumsy from Mosso, clumsy. Mm -hmm. If he's just more disciplined, you probably don't concede that second goal. And then the third goal that really just put the cherry oh, yeah. on top for Pumas was a banger, a golazo. And Chivas had already overcommitted, so he was, you know, two on one, three on two at the back. Three nil probably might have just been one nil, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would have been tight. And if you, the longer it's nil nil, I think actually favors, would have mm -hmm. favored you. So 
Yes, Chivas, I don't think, did enough to even like deserve to go through because it was a poor performance in the sense that they just could not get back into the game. No matter what they threw at Pumas, Pumas were pretty comfortable to defend what Chivas had for mm-hmm. them. But 3 0 flatters Pumas, I think. I really do think so. So I think it's a lot tighter of a result. Pumas sure deserved to go through. But yeah, I'm not. I'm not impressed with Pumas. Is basically what I'm saying. Okay, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. I don't know if I see them as title contenders, but I do yeah. think that they had a good game. I think across 180 minutes, they were the better team slightly. I really do. And it was a classic four or five seed matchup. The same shit we see in the NBA. The same shit we see in the NBA when it's the fourth seed versus the fifth seed. It's tight. It's, it's really tight. close. Yeah. And I think, yes, we were involved in that sense, but ultimately, neither of these teams convinced me as title contenders. Yeah. And I think that Chivas just. Ended up, you know, it just ended up flaming out, man. That's why I, it could have been closer. I don't really care, bro, because I, I think this team just doesn't just doesn't strike me as a team that could have faced adversity and made it through and gone on this type of magical run that we saw last year. That's why I'm not so, you know, fired up. 100. percent Yeah. If Chivas played this, if Chivas could have played this game again and won, I see their story ending definitively in the semifinals. There's just no way the Chivas team did not have the cohesion, the f- cohesion, the fluidity that they had last semester. The team that has improved upon last semester is Atletico San Luis. Atletico San Luis, man. Vitinho, some are calling him Viticius Jr., <laughs> having a crazy, crazy goal in this match to give them the lead. Monterrey, the number two seed, falls short and does not make it deep into the Ligia once again. Are we surprised crazy, by that? Crazy, bro. Are we surprised? Is anybody surprised oh, by no, that? Oh, no, we're not surprised at all, brother. You know why? <laughs> because they're headed by a man that is only known for his regular season performances. A man that is a regular season coach in La Ligia. A man that does not know anything else outside of being a regular. When he goes out to bars, they know him as a regular. When he goes home, he watches the regular show. When he skates, he doesn't skate goofy. He skates regular. He's a regular guy. And that man is Dan Ortiz, bro. Mm-hmm. Dan Ortiz, to me, fully showed once again that he is 100% built for the regular season. And that is it, bro. No longer give this man elite clubs. No longer give him teams that are worthy of trying to go for the title. No longer is that able to be something worth contending or considering. Put him on a fucking Puebla team. Put him on a fucking uh, Mazatlan team. And he, maybe he can do something good. But for now, I think he's on fraud alert. Personally, I hate that he did this once again with a team that was much better than what they showed once the Liga arrived. Dan Ortiz, a regular man. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a problem with Monterrey in general, though, because the amount of quality that they have consistently year to year they're also one of the most richest clubs in all of mexico i'm gonna take i'm gonna take this just as an objective type of take here i think monterey are clinically becoming ligia losers and it's it's a what's interesting we'll get to that it's a problem that america's kind of had for the last six years and we'll, we'll get to that later too but monterey cannot figure it out in the playoff format they just they just can't and I, I think it is because the regular season's just not easy, but that's where the money that's where the money comes into play because their lesser opponents aren't dying for a result. They're not going for it. So if you already have a one 0 lead at halftime, maybe they're, they're they're like, all right, we're just gonna get it later. We're we're gonna come back and playoffs and beat you. Whereas Monter- for so for Monterrey, they just get these really good wins throughout the regular season, and when push finally comes to shove, they fail. They should have honestly beaten San Luis on the day. The way that they started, so impressive. They should have been up two, maybe even three nil by the 30th minute. San Luis were chasing shadows for 15 straight minutes, but Monterrey couldn't quite capitalize. They did get that early goal. And at that moment, the floodgates should have opened. But instead, Monterrey got a little wasteful. And now that San Luis slowly got a lot more comfortable in this match. But that's just, for me, that shows me that Monterrey just don't ultimately have it. Whether it's the coach, whether it's the players, they're lacking something. And I I do think it's that ability to be clinical in high-pressure situations. Monterrey don't have it, bro. Well, then that's pathetic, bro. It's pathetic. That's pathetic. They should have won this game. Expensive 
uh, this is the most expensive 11 in all Liga MX this season. Yeah. That's pathetic then, what it's you're pa- saying. That's what the, I'm the saying. The most expensive team should be able to face adversity, should be able to win a game where they had twice as many shots on the opponent's goal. Exactly. That's why I think I attach it to Tano Ortiz, but I'm with you. Let's attach it to the fucking club then. I'm go- Let's yeah, put I'm, it on them. I'm going big picture because I, I, I low-key think it's getting viral. Like if you go to Monterrey, all of a sudden, you're just not as clinical. You don't want it as much. Maybe money is actually a factor. I don't know. I don't know that's how good crazy. they're living over there. That's crazy to me because right across the street, you have a Tigre side that's yeah. the complete op- opposite. Yeah, that's man. what's crazy. That's just pure, like, ah, and man, the, the way they ran money, themselves. The same money, too. Yeah, yeah. That's what's crazy. Huh. And it's that's why I'm really fed up here because Monterrey as a club cannot get that same energy that Tigres have. Mm-hmm. And it's super disappointing because the quality is pretty similar. They should have beaten San Luis on the day. In San Luis, I think Atletico were the better team, but for the first 45 minutes in Monterrey, they should have sh- shut them down. Uh, but they didn't. I'll agree with that. I'll agree with that, man. At least Chivas has the excuse of, oh, we can only use Mexican players. At least we have that. <laughs> Monterrey has, they can get whoever they want, bro. Yeah. And they can get players that aren't even uh, conceivable for some of these smaller clubs in Liga Mekis. And to achieve this, bro, mm. I think I, I just, I got to keep using the word. It's pathetic and it's regular. This is the usual. It's regular. It, it's it, the usual. Yeah, no, it, it is. And that's why I don't take into account Monterey's regular season. Mm. I haven't taken that. Can't anymore. I, I, I can't, can't and, and I won't. I won't from now on. I, I, won't, I have not taken into account for the last like four years, man. Mm. And it's accurate it doesn't matter how good of a season Monterrey have they do not show up in playoff setting they just don't but it's because they lack grit they lack true passion and then when they actually face a decent opponent who's actually trying to win they, they lose Damn, they don't man. get the result here obviously 1-1 but complete credit to Atletico San Luis because I thought they were gonna crumble and collapse here very similar to how Cincinnati did but after like 25 30 minutes they, they got sturdy they got disciplined. They finally closed down the space, and then they started to attack. Two really good changes from Gustavo Leao at the start of the second half, bringing on the OGs Murillo and Vitinho. An immediate mm-hmm. impact, by the way. Murillo getting on the end of a ball, penetrating all the way to Monterrey's box. Ball somehow finds a way to Vitinho, and he coolly finishes it man my goodness dude man. i love i love i love the fact that when he celebrated he he did the whole messy taking off their jersey showing yeah. it to the crowd like Muri, like uh vitinho he was having his moment yeah man. he was like no we're gonna make this about me right now <laughs> and he was like really open to like just uh, have like just having it all be about him in that moment and i loved it i love it because you could see how pissed off the monterrey fans were <laughs> mm-hmm. and i just but it should piss them off because i'm like y'all should be doing way better right now you got Vitinho right now showcasing his jersey off to you exactly. and no disrespect to Vitinho but like come on man exactly. he's, he's, he's putting on a messy like celebration <laughs> do something about that and get back the lead and they ultimately couldn't bro but San Luis was praying to San Luis yeah. and he came through for him with this victory when I Bilbao had some insane stops in the box from a d- defensive perspective absolutely ridiculous and yeah San Luis it got a little close, but they, they figured it out, and they were able to hold off a just really disappointing Monterrey side. Mm-hmm. So congratulations to Atletico San Luis. They they have a really fun matchup coming up in the semifinals, of a matchup that they actually saw in last semester's quarterfinals against America. America versus Leon. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. This game was interesting. It was actually kind of... Actually, no. Interesting is not the word. This game was weird. First 45 minutes... America had all of the makings to just dominate Leon. And it was actually Leon who had the better chances. Vinas had two really, really good chances. One of them actually hitting the post. I think crazy. it was the wrong decision. He should have passed it off. Either way, he got that close enough, so I, I, let, I let him have it. There was another chance where the ball kind of bobbled in the box off of a rebound, and he just and skies it just mm-hmm. ever so slightly. Mm-hmm. Just ever so slightly, but three... I'll count them three pretty good chances that we could have at least put away one of them. At least one. Unfortunately, we just were not clinical whatsoever in those first half chances. And America, I'm not going to say that they were lackluster. And I'm not going to say that Leon was putting that much pressure against America. But America just kind of looked average. They didn't look poor, but they didn't look great. 
Come the second half, though, Leon pretty much had zero chances. They couldn't pass the ball more than three, four times. America completely dominated yeah. them in the second half, completely took over. It wasn't even a contest, in my mm-hmm. opinion, in the second half. Mm-hmm. And I'm not surprised because this is the this is the status of Leon. We are a eight to ten type of seed, and this is how we play. We can compete, but when push really comes to shove, yeah, we're the inferior team. You know, we're lacking a lot of offensive grit that we used to have. You know, like players like Angel Menor, Joel Campo in his prime, Vitor Davila, all have left, right? They're, they're no longer here. And so what are we left with? Well, we're left with an America reject Vinas. And there's a reason why he left America, bro. Yeah, yeah. He cannot finish. Yeah. One of the most wasteful strikers in Liga Mekis, in my opinion, we have him. They don't have him, bro. <laughs> that, that's who we have to rely on to get a big goal in a Liga setting. It's not going to happen. Yeah, it's yeah. just not going to happen. Yeah. And we, th- that, that's kind of it. We have yeah. Borja Sanchez, who's, you know, Spanish. He, he's good. Is he a finisher? No, not really, man. Honestly, not really. And th- that's it. We have Nicolas Lopez, also a reject from Tigres. The uh, Tigres were happy to let him go because he never really figured himself out. And he still hasn't fully figured himself out in Mexico. He has moments. That's it. So Leon have a bunch of decent players who ultimately don't know how to finish on a consistent basis. So I'm not surprised by this result whatsoever. America deserved to go through. They are the better team. I'm just a little surprised that America didn't do it in the style that they've done during the regular season. But this has happened over the last couple of league years. But America can't make a final. And they dominate in the regular season. And it's the same thing you could say about Monterrey. They have the money, so when they play in the regular season, when it doesn't fully matter, of course they're going to win. But when push comes to shove in a playoff setting, America low-key kind of choke. Mm-hmm. And I thought this was going to be the year that they go to the final in style. And then, you know, maybe... Mm. maybe Where they leave no room for doubt, you're saying? They leave no room for okay. doubt. That's exactly what I'm okay. saying. Where they go in style to the final. And then from there, who knows? It's a final, right? I'm, I'm never going to put pressure on a team to win a final. Not full pressure. But I thought America were going to easily get through Leon, yeah. and honestly it, it was only up until that second the half last, yeah. it was the last Across half two games yeah. uh, last half and now they're gonna play against a very feisty side in Atletico San Luis who truly if San Luis played the same way that they played against Monterrey especially at home in that first leg someone's gonna have a decent chance they're gonna have a decent yeah. chance here uh, and Ametic are gonna have to play a lot more dominant to make sure that they get in that final otherwise we have an upset in our hands with San Luis going through, possibly. Yeah. yeah. I think for the going back to the Medica Leon game, just from my perspective as a man who doesn't care for either of these teams sure, personally, yeah. I thought the first half was entertaining, right? It's 2 2 going into this game. And like you said, Leon <laughs> had opportunities. That was keeping me captivated. It's crazy. But for the most part, man, I just thought this was such a boring game. This was a boring game for me, but I think it's because of the lack of threat that Leon posed and yeah. also of the weird shakiness that America was showing in that first half. Luckily, the savior of boredom is a Panenka penalty goal, right? And we got that with Julian Quinones getting a little cheeky there and getting the ball past Rodolfo Cota with a crazy Panenka. Credit to him. I wanted to highlight that because we're talking about America doing this in style. They did not do this in the first 135 minutes of this matchup, but in the last 45, they started to tap into what they've been doing this whole regular season, and it started with Julian Quinones scoring a beautiful Panenka penalty goal. Credit to them. Shout out to them for that. That's it, though. That's it. That, that's all that's that stood it. out to me no, from this 90 minutes it. after watching the Cincinnati uh, Columbus <laughs> crew game. This was the next game up, and I was so bored, man. So yeah, I'm glad this matchup is gun- done. I'm glad Leon's out. Let's move on here. But yes, hopefully what awaits us is going to be an electric matchup with Atletico San Luis and America because even if America shows up to 100%, we could see a very back and forth game with how much offensive impetus both these teams have to offer. And you just never know, man. You never know in Liga Mekis with these teams that start to gain form throughout the tournament. Atletico San Luis getting a historic result against Monterrey as a seven seed. If they can continue just having that confidence, having that run of form and maybe a little bit of magic we might see america lose once again in the semifinal of the liga and mekis ligia will it happen though i'm going america but 
I'm going to be rooting for Atletico. One of those. I'm going to be rooting yeah. for him. But I think America will pull it through. Maybe it's just on a draw and they just go through as the higher seed. Who knows? I really love San Luis's options offensively. And it'll be a completely different experience for America compared to Leon. Completely different. Yeah. I, I just, man, I really think that the advantage that's given to the higher seed, which I don't criticize, I just think the advantage is given is huge, bro. It's huge. When it, when it does count, and it still does count. Up until the semifinal, Leon, San, Atlético San Luis is going to have to score a number of goals against América, yeah. who, ah, man, I think when they bunker down, they are able to hold their own defensively. When they do bunker down, they're able to do it. I think San Luis might get a goal or two, but ah, I'm going to go América here, mainly because they have that, that advantage. Mm-hmm. I really do. I think it's going to work out for them, and they'll be able to go to the final for the first time in a while. In a while, man. I just think... Over the course of two legs, either Quinones, Martin, or Zendejas, maybe even Fidalgo, will be able to break Atletico San Luis a couple times, at least. Whereas Atletico San Luis, they really rely on energy to get them through it. And to do that for 180 full minutes, I just don't know if they can sustain that. They have some really fun players, though. I mean, mm-hmm. Vitinho, Murillo, mm-hmm. Jurgen Dan when he's on it, Sale La Monge, French players somehow found his way to San Luis. Like, really interesting players who are in decent form right now. They have some underrated players, too, like Dieter Villalpando, Rodrigo Dorado. So I like this San Luis team, and I do think they can hurt America. I, I, I just think America will be able to pull through here just yeah. because of the sheer quality that they have in all 11 positions. Yeah, then that's considering that the guys like Diego Valdez haven't fully woken, woken up yet, man. Yeah, yeah. Hasn't yeah. woken up yet. And I, I, I wonder if he just has his trademark game in La Liguilla. Mm. That could be all it takes to take down this team in San Luis. I think one of these guys will step up. Quiñones as well. Who will it be? I don't know. I just think America, like you said, has those players, has those names that at any given moment, once they find their form, once they just tap into the match in ways that other teams aren't able to, they can beat an opponent, bro. Yeah. And I, I think we're going to see that in the semifinal. On the other hand, we have Tigres set to match up against Pumas. We going Tigres? I'm going Tigres for sure, dude. That's crazy, then, man. That That's is crazy, crazy bro. That Holy is crazy shit, because man. they might become the fourth team to win back to back. God titles. damn. And dude, honestly, I think they have a great chance. God damn. I think they have a really even if it's America who is in that if we get a Tigres America final, I honestly don't I, Tigres will have a 50-50 shot, bro. I, I'm gonna put it like that. Like, even though America's been the better team, sure, over the course of the season. Tigres always have a crazy yeah. shot to win, dude. Oh, shit. We didn't even talk about the Tigres-Puebla match. Yeah, Tigres-Puebla. Dominant. They balled out. Dude, dominant, They man. balled out, man. Gignac getting a free kick. Just Tigres going off Corriaran. But that's what I'm saying, involved, man. Getting like, involved, like Gignac always shows up, man. Like, yeah. once it's time, once those bright lights are on, mm-hmm. it's time. He shows up. It's so hard to find that everywhere else in Liga and man. Oh, yeah. And it's credit to Gignac. That's why he's one of the greatest of all time in this league because when he's asked to step up, God, dude, he does it in stylish fashion, doing it today through a crazy free kick goal to put himself up, to put Tigres up, what, 2-0 at the time? And to go on and dominate this match. Gignac, you know with confidence, is going to show up in these games. And I think that's huge, bro. Huge for Tigres going forward. Yeah, Ibanez getting that third little goal to just kind of put the nail in the coffin against Puebla with a nice little scissor kick. What's funny is that Puebla actually played a decent game. Like, they did as much as they could, but that's what it was. It was the sheer offensive ability of Tigres that won them this match 3-0. That's all it was. They're so good offensively that kind of no matter what you throw at them, you're probably going to concede a couple goals. So then the question is can not the question isn't really can you beat Tigres, it's just can you outscore them? And more often than not, man, unless you have an insanely good offense, you're probably not going to do that because Tigres have a guy like Andre Piagignac who's one of the greatest who've ever played in Mexico, dude. Now, could the team that could potentially outscore them be this firing Puma side. Is that the way that they go about in order to beat Tigres? If they want to have a chance at doing it, is it through their offense? Is it through Chino Huerta just going off and being that guy and potentially having their defense show up in a way that actually challenges Tigres and thus you see Pumas actually make it to the final? How do they do it, man? I just think no because, you know, you could go pound for pound here. If you have Huerta, Lainez, I actually still think Lainez is slightly the better player. If you have Gignac against Gabriel Fernandez, I think Gignac's the better player. 
And then if you have Aquino on the other side, Tata Salvio, eh, maybe that's a little bit more even. Tigres still get the win there. And then when you look at Tigres' midfield, you have Gorriarán, who's so good in these settings. And Pumas don't really have a player like Gorriarán. And so for me, Pumas are a very, very good team. They're pretty balanced. I think Tigres is just better. And I think that's going to show out here. I don't think Pumas can do it. I really don't. Damn. Yeah, so that's, so that's there's no crazy. game plan. There's no game. And, then, and then, of course, you have Cordoba, who's been yeah, so Cordoba's good at great. Tigres, man. Cordoba's great. So, like, I don't really see many flaws when it comes to Tigres' game. Even if they have a bad, so unquote bad game, they figure out a way to just keep it tight and get a goal. Did you say Linus over Ch- Chino Huerta? Yeah, that's what's crazy. Nah, man. Nah, yeah. nah. That's a howler. That's a howler. No, 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 nah, no, no. no. Nah. Really, really, what's he good at that Chino isn't then? What does he have better? I think overall penetration. No. Especially, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I yeah. think that's the difference. I think Chino is much better with penetration than Linus. Linus can be erratic, bro. He can be erratic. Sure. And I think I just too often see him penetrate and go out towards the out-of-bounds line or go out towards like the corner flag. He's a little inconsistent. Not as consistent or as I di- direct as I think Huerta is. And I think he'd be more successful if we look at the numbers. I don't know. That'd be fun to look at. Yeah. But I think I would assume that Huerta would be more successful or more efficient with his dribble penetration. I think my only thing with Huerta is that when I do see him penetrate, I don't... Does he really combine with a lot of his players? Usually it's on, like on ISO, which is great because if you need a guy just completely out on the wing, Huerta's going to be your guy. And then once he gets far forward, he can put in a cross or he can try and get involved. Whereas when Linus combines, it's usually one-two touch with either Gignac or some of his midfielders. And I think that's just a little bit more effective. Maybe not from just Linus versus just Huerta, but from a whole team perspective, I think Linus does a little bit more for Tigres than Mm. Huerta does for Pumas collectively. Uh, Now, does Huerta probably get more goals and assists? Sure, but against... A ton more. uh, Yeah, but against Tigres, against Tigres defensively, I think Huerta's going to be shut down a little bit more. I think the same would happen to Linus, though. I think if Linus was in, in Huerta's position, he would get, dude, he'd be invisible against Tigres because that's what's happened his whole career. But is Linus isn't able to make an impact. But I think that's more credit to Tigres' defense. I don't trust Pumas' defense versus Tigres' defense. And I think Linus will have an easier time playing against Pumas than Linus would have playing against Tigres, which is why I think Wait, Linus has a better opportunity here. No, I'm saying, uh, like, if Linus was in Huerta's position, we're talking about Linus versus Huerta, I'm saying if Linus played for Pumas... That's what I'm saying. Right? He I would have a harder be... time because Tigres' defense is way better than Pumas's. Yeah, and I, yeah. yeah, but that's what I'm saying is a sign of Huerta being better. But I think Huerta's going to get shut down, is what I, I'm, I'm saying. I'm saying Linus would get even more shut down. He would go invisible. I don't think he'd even start the game. He, I, I don't think he'd be as impactful. I am basically agree with you. I think they both would be shut down. So, therefore, Linus is going to have a bigger impact because he's not going to. Huerta is. If you look at it the other way, too, I think if you look at Pumas and the responsibility that's given to Huerta... I don't think Linus could produce if he was given that responsibility. Given it's a different style, but I think that says a lot about a winger who isn't able to adapt or have as much versatility. I think what that would be better overall. Because I think what we're saying here is almost like uh, Linus is like a Jack Grealish, right? Very good combining with his team. Doesn't have the numbers necessary to back up his impact, but he is very good. And what does like Doku? Where he's just very direct. Yeah. Numbers, and he has Actually, the numbers to back comparison. it up, right? So it's different stylistically, and I will agree with that, which is where the comparison kind of falters. Yeah. But I think when it comes to preference, that's why I have a preference with Huerta, specifically because I do think he has more versatility to offer than Linus because I've never he's seen Linus have the sort of season that Huerta's having right now. And until he does, and I'm going to go Huerta because I do think he can do what Linus does instead. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, okay. I, I agree with that. I'm just saying overall... I think Linus fits with Tigres more effectively. With Tigres? With, that's another, I think that's another effectively. question. Yeah. Effectively. In that situation, I, yeah, I, I would have to, I don't know, I, I think I still like Huerta, but yeah, yeah, I, I think I'd entertain it with Tigres specifically. So then we're setting up a final here between Tigres and America. And we're going to be in Argentina. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, we, so we, we should project this out, right? We yeah, should project yeah, yeah. this out to see how it's going to look. Oh, God. Tigres America is what we project. Yeah. Could be San Luis Pumas. <laughs> that'd be insane, that'd be insane bro. Insane, if I come back from Argentina and that's what's waiting or that's what has happened in the Liga de Mekis, I'd be like, what the <laughs> fuck happened while I was gone, dude? Puma San Luis, it's looking like, at least for us, America Tigres, who wins the title this year? 
man it, for me it's gonna be com- for me it's gonna be completely dependent on how america beat san luis if it's barely and Loki a little lucky i'm going tigres if they're able to beat San Luis somewhat convincingly, then no matter what Tigres do against Pumas, I'm going América. So I'm completely looking at the América-San Luis matchup. That'll dictate for me what happens. If I have to choose right now, I'm going 50-50. I don't know if I can mm. actually choose one. Mm. Yeah. I would actually go Tigres just because they had an easier time against Puebla. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at that semifinal matchup before I actually make a decision. For sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah, just kind of projecting a little farther away. I'm going Tigres. I'm going yeah. Tigres. I think, man, back-to-back MLS trophies during what is another, yet another golden era for them is crazy. And I just trust them more. I trust them more in these knockout settings now. I trust them I more know. than America team who completely turned against Chivas last year and who wasn't too convincing against Leon so far. I think Tigres, when it comes to those bright lights, is just the better team with the more experienced players. And the idea of Guignac adding yet another trophy to that tra- to that trophy cabinet that he has here in Mexico will just further solidify him as potentially the greatest player of all time that has stepped foot in this league. And all the other guys, Linus, Cordoba, guys like Goriaran, Nahuel Guzman as well. Just these guys adding more silver- silverware once again after what was an incredible run last year. Just going to be crazy, man. Going to be crazy to see it once again. And I do think it's going to happen with Tigres lifting the trophy. Dude, yeah. <sighs> It'd just be crazy to see them do it again. The amount of trophies that Gignac, like specifically, has brought Tigres is ridiculous. And I, I, it got me thinking, like, what are Tigres going to do? And this is a good problem to have, but what are they going to do when Gignac is just Damn, done? dude. Like, oh, you man. can't, and th- there's, it, it's a compliment, but you just can't replace that. Like, good Lord. And then e- even look at the back with Guzman. What other keeper, from a character perspective, could do the same thing that Nahuel Guzman has done for Tigres, dude? Like, you know, despite all of his antics, and that makes Guzman who he is, yeah. he's also a hell of a shot no, stopper. He's great. And he's had some insane highlights over the career, over his career with Tigres. How do you replace that? And then even look at the midfield players like, you know, Guido Pizarro, like... These are players that truly, in my eyes, are irreplaceable. And you can find players who might be close to as good, but how are they going to do it over the eight-year period that these guys have? Insane. Yeah. Fuck. Let me think. Let me think if there's a solution out there for you that I can get you. I'm thinking what deals are in the transfer market. I wonder if Tigres... Are aware of it? Are, are, well, first off, are aware of it, but like, let's say Gignac is set to just retire in a year or two. Let's just say that. Like, are Tigres going to try to find the next Gignac and go to Europe, find a guy who's willing to come to Mexico for a long time and try to dominate? Are they going to try to do that? Dude. Or are they going to be like, shit, like, we're never going to get another Gignac, so we're not even going to try? Dude, I, that'd I, I wonder. Fascinating. Yeah. That'd be fa- yeah, that'd be fascinating to see. I, I, oh man, I would put my money that they go out to Europe to try to find yet another young French player that just hasn't quite cut it in the Europe in the European leagues, but wants to find or follow in the footsteps of Gignac. I would, I would put my money on that first mm-hmm. because just the idea of. Tigres without a character like Gignac right. isn't Tigres anymore, man. He's saying. completely changed the trajectory of this club into what's been a completely dominant side since 2010, dude. It's been incredible what he's done as well as Nahuel Guzman and how he's impacted the team. There's guys out there, but they're going to have to do some Brighton level scouting to find that next talent because they, in a way, did get lucky with Gignac. Yeah, yeah, like for they, sure. I, did they for think sure. this would happen? <laughs> I don't, know. I don't know. I think this is more beyond the best case scenario. This is the ultimate case scenario when it comes to getting a guy from Europe to try out Liga and Mekis. The fact that he's embraced the culture, that he's wanted yeah. to stay, that he likes to go party, that he knows the language. Like these things aren't something that just, just you can just find in like some random youth academy in Spain, bro. Like yeah. it's different. And I think that Guignac is one of a kind and they'll try to replicate it, but over time. I don't know if they will, man. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah, because they tried to get Florian Tauvan, mm-hmm. an- another French player who was not, not in his prime, but also wasn't in his veteran years whatsoever. And he, he didn't play poorly, but just uh, there's like a cultural difference. There's some big difference that couldn't be overcome, and it just didn't end up working out, and he went back to Europe. 
but that that's just what it was. So yeah, I think it's going to be a lot harder. And they could definitely got very very lucky with Gignac. But I mean, just screw it. I'd rather they get lucky than not because yeah. what a revelation he's been, man. You yeah. talk about like Messi making an immediate impact with Inter Miami. I mean, Gignac was with that, but eight years ago when he came to Tigres, he's been tremendous. And that's that's my thing is that when I think of Tigres, first thing I think of is Guzman yeah. Gignac. That's the first thing I think of. So to see a team field for Tigres that don't have those two players on the pitch, I, that's just going to be bizarre to see. What's your What's your favorite attribute about Gignac's game specifically? I just love how clinical he is, dude. Mm. I just know that if he gets a half chance in the box, he has the highest chance out of any striker in Liga MX to put it away. That's what really gets me about Gignac because... You anything, whether it's an aerial chance, a volley, a one-two touch, free kick, or a free kick, or he actually has time to settle, it's Gignac, man, and he's probably gonna put it away. It's ridiculous, and especially when he was actually in his prime, dude, he was a monster. And that's what's crazy is that even in the twilight of his career, he's still one of the best players in Mexico. That's how good he is. His IQ is so high. He's so clinical. Gignac's just a monster in front of goal. Yeah, it's been beautiful to see, man. It, for Mexico to host such a talent, I think it's been incredible for the league, yeah. for the league's history, for the fans, and the way that the Tigres fan base embraced him too, I think was very important to make him feel at home, to make him feel welcomed, all in all creating what is, I think, the greatest player in Liga Mekis history that we've ever seen so far with his goal count, with his ability to impact games, and then most of all, his silverware, bro. That man has a stacked trophy cabinet somewhere out there in Mexico and he's going to be revisiting it very often because in my opinion this dude is more mexican than he is french now bro yeah. he can come to the yeah. carne asada as they say this dude is as mexican as they come and it's beautiful to see the mls cup final is set we have columbus crew set to face off against lafc who's looking to defend their trophy but the journey that these teams went on was absolutely bonkers. And more specifically, with the matchup that we saw in Ohio and the hell is real rivalry, Cincinnati, Columbus Crew. What'd you think about this match, brother? It's playoff season, baby. We got treated to some incredible games this entire playoff season. And it has possibly peaked with yeah. this Cincinnati against Columbus Crew matchup because holy shit, dude. What an insane second half. And I have no other way to start this whole analysis other than just by pointing out the obvious here. Cincinnati choked. Oh. They choked oh. bad, man. Mm -hmm. And I want to make this very, very clear. If my team, if I'm supporting a team and they ever lose the way Cincinnati lost against the Columbus Crew in the MLS semifinals... I'm gonna have to think about not supporting that team anymore, bro, because it, Logan, and I'm, it's gonna sound very harsh here, it was pathetic. It was really, really bad. After they went off in the first half with Brandon Vasquez settling the ball insanely guys, well guys. and then turning perfectly, doing a nice little reverse to get the big, to get the lead 1 0. And then later on, Luciano Acosta with a beautiful, gorgeous MVP. curler. MVP. MVP. 2-0. Bupenza could have made it 3-0 later on. Cincinnati were flying so, so high. Columbus crew applied a little bit of pressure in that second half. All credit to them, by the way, and I'll get into that later. But with that extra applied pressure, Cincinnati went on to crumble. Absolutely collapse. And what happened was once that first goal went in, dude, Cincinnati forgot how to defend. They went from a near championship contending side to like a third division USL side playing against a really good Columbus crew team, man. And I was I was so disappointed with how Cincinnati ended up defending this the, in the rest of the second half, also the rest of extra time because the amount of ball watching that I saw was absurd, horrendous. They were so reactive. There was not an ounce of proactivity in that Cincinnati defense. Columbus crew essentially just threw four players at them nonstop and it was just run after run after run but instead of tracking instead of trying to meet the player who had the ball they stayed back stayed right on the top of the box let the player who had the ball kind of just pick out a player and if their players running past them they would realize that and then they try to go follow they were chasing shadows chasing shadows the entire second half so 
it was no surprise to me that Columbus Crew was able to get that equalizer and then go on to win in extra time because the moment that Cincinnati got nervous and absolutely collapsed, it was clear that Columbus Crew were going to win this match. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think I agree with most of that analysis because I, that was my same result. My same reaction, bro, was, damn, dude, Cincinnati choked this game. The only thing I will say, bro, is that I think the difference here is that I think it, I think it was a forced choke. I think Columbus almost approached this game like a serpent that just starts to wrap themselves around slowly against their prey and just starts applying more and more pressure until their eyes fucking bulge out. That was visceral, that was visceral Jesus Christ. <laughs> but I think that Columbus crew was able to, sign, to find some sort of flaw in Cincinnati that I just wasn't aware that they had, bro. Because throughout this entire game, especially once the second half started, because in that first half, it was a completely different game, in my opinion. Right. Once the second half starts, bro, what I saw from Columbus crew, I thought was so impressive their decision making their fluidity when they had possession really stood out to me and they were just a really good cohesive team and I guess it tired out the Cincinnati players it outsmarted them but also just showed that overall Columbus crew just wanted it more man yes. Cincinnati thought they had it won after 45 minutes they came, they came back out of that locker to go into that second half and they just I don't know if they got too cocky. I don't know if they got into their heads. They started celebrating a little too early. But Columbus crew kept applying that pressure. And they got stronger and stronger and stronger until they finally equalized in, what, the 81st minute, I think? Mm -hmm. But by that point, it almost seemed like it was destined to happen. Yeah. You go into extra time. This was Columbus crew's all day, bro. Columbus crew just took out the sting completely to their credit and killed their prey in this match, bro. 100%. I, I just get more frustrated though because look at the game-winning goal. Columbus Crew, quick throw, and Luciano Acosta can barely move. He can barely walk. Concedes a throw, and they do quick throw in. Cincinnati, realize it late. Bro, you're in extra time. Bro, what get did, back. What, did Lucy, what are they doing? What did, I don't understand. What did Acosta do in the build-up to lead to that throw-in, bro? He was trying to, trying to like do a little yeah, double flick man. to get through Come it. Come on, bro. And that's what I'm saying. And then they, they switch it over to the left-hand side. From there, they cross it over to a wide, and I mean mm -hmm. wide, open Cucho who had an amazing game again no no discredit no discredit here to Columbus but and had an amazing game but he's wide open and the the substitute who was fresh for Cincinnati just watched him do it I was in, in really pathetic defending from Cincinnati really yeah. pathetic I don't know what it is about adversity or high pressure situations they they lose all control in that back line it happened the US Open Cup uh, semifinal or final against Inter Miami yeah. and then the same final play Messi finds a player on the run defense isn't there they tied they lose the match on penalties it's crazy I think it's just I think it's something that we didn't or weren't aware was going to be such an important flaw in Cincinnati's defense that ultimately came to bite them in this championship contending season that is their legacy that is what they're going to be known for and what was a supporter shield winning season is a team that ultimately lost all sort of know-how defensively Dude, yes they completely lost their composure and you're right though because i do think that this is in cincinnati's dna all you have to do is throw four forwards at them and they crumble mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. they don't know who to track they don't know how to be proactive about preventing it and yeah you'll get a couple of goals because by like the 65th minute i was like there's no way cincinnati hold on to here mm -mm. like there was just no way and there was still 30 minutes left in the game but they were so lifeless man it was, that was that's, crazy that's was so there was frustrating. nothing there was nothing and i think there's a couple of mistakes from the coach though it, because he you know he took mm -hmm. off pupenza he took off kubo luciano costa i think personally should have been taken off i know he wanted to stay on the pitch but if you're trying to survive if you're trying to defend for your life you need everybody back and that's that, that was another really frustrating thing because it was still 2-0 and Cincinnati I know they could sense that Columbus was going at them hard and that their Columbus's pressure was growing and even in that moment Cincinnati still had five players forward and they were just relying on their back line to handle six Columbus crew players. There's no way you're going to get away with that. Like when every, when you have an opponent up against you, you put everybody back, you put everybody in the box, but for some reason they were still willing to just play a really mm -hmm. spread out mm -hmm. expansive game. And that only worked into Columbus's favor because as you already kind of pointed out, they started to move the ball around really, really well, very, very accurately. Cucho Beautiful. Hernandez had an incredible game. 
constant, constantly making runs, getting on the end of really good passes, but also creating. He was also getting the ball back to goal, feeding it off to his wingers or you know, applying the actual final pass to make a really good chance for Columbus. He had an incredible game. So did Cristian Ramirez once, once he was able to come on and apply just even more pressure against that Cincinnati back line. But completely deserved here from Columbus because, again, as you said before, they proved to me that they wanted it way, yep. and I mean way more. Yep, Wilfred Nancy with some really good decisions, in my opinion, bringing Julian Gressel off the bench, the Andy Robertson of the MLS with the way he sends these balls in. Yeah. Guto Hernandez had a great game. Rossi, Nagby, one of the greatest defensive midfielders the MLS has ever seen, going to his third MLS Cup final, already having won two. Mm-hmm. Farsi, the... <laughs> The what was he? The was the uh, the uh, the Canadian foosball greatest player of the year. Did you hear that shit? Is that what he? Is? Yeah, Farsi one is like the, he's like a expert foosball player. Really? Then tried out for some team in Canada, makes it to the Canadian Premier League, and then gets purchased by Columbus Crew and ends up now in an MLS Cup final. He started his career through foosball, bro. <laughs> That's foosball. A Munson, a Munson. I thought really stood Amundsen, out to me yeah. with his uh with his I, his bravery when he was on the ball. He was really smart. Cristian Ramirez as well. And yes, this whole team overall, Columbus crew just really taking it to Cincinnati and the hell is real rivalry. But ultimately, man, what a match. This really felt to me, given that it happened within an American sports context, it felt like when I watched the Kansas City Chiefs face off against the Bills in like these really big matches. It felt yeah. like the Warriors against the Cleveland Cavaliers and, and that insane matchup where LeBron went on to... Like this felt like a game seven with an American sports. Yeah. And that yeah. was really dope to see, bro, because yeah, crazy. to me, it has been the height so far, this MLS playoffs so far, with what we've seen. Crazy game, crazy quality, crazy fucking decision making. All in all ending with Columbus crew going to a final. Yeah, congratulations to Columbus who, you know, just won the MLS three years ago. So they're back they're back they've the amount of consistency that they've had over the last decade has been so impressive and i, I think that's what really showed today is that these players know that they they have there's a bit of a legacy going on in columbus mm-hmm. and they are continuing that by getting this insane result on the road against the rivals to go to the mls cup final it's so impressive yeah. and congratulations league og man one of the league ogs yeah. here making it to the final it's good to yeah. see and on the other side we have lafc who hosted Houston Dynamo. <laughs> I literally have just one sentence to sum up this game personally. Yeah. LAFC at home is unbeatable, bro. Mm-hmm. They're so tough to beat. My goodness, when the atmosphere is rocking like that, when the players are yeah. feeling themselves, yeah, they're, the oh. experience. I mean, this is one of the best LAFC performances I've seen so far this year. And Houston Dynamo, for me, just did not show up the way that I was hoping them to. Ultimately resulting in LAFC going to this final and now being matched up with Columbus Crew. My takeaway is just that LAFC at home, something else, dude. Yeah, I, 100%. And I'll, I'll get into that aspect in a second. Going into the game, though, I was actually really excited about this matchup because the two styles that these teams possess could not be more different. Houston Dynamo really like to play a really risky game where they overload on either the right or left side with Dorsey going forward completely or Escobar completely going forward and committing themselves. And when they do do that... There's no coverage. They leave either flank completely wide open. And the reason why is because they don't have a really good center forward. They don't have a right winger either. It's just Quinones and Baird and then like five midfielders. So the way to get around that is they try to overcommit with fullbacks. Such a cool way to play. And I actually really credit Ben Olsen to... First of all, applying that type of style with his Houston team and then also being successful with it because they made their way all the way to an MLS semifinal doing it this way. So impressive. And they won the U.S. Open Cup. Mm-hmm. So Houston have had a, such a good season playing a very risky, high-risk, high-reward type of style. And then you have LAFC who are just a lot more balanced, right? A really good backline, some talent in the midfield, and then obviously shine up top with Vela and Buanga. And so I was so excited to see who was going to come out on top. Obviously, LAFC have been very, very good at home. And I think they were the better team going into this. I thought their win against Seattle was very, very impressive. But I also thought Houston's win against Sporting KC was Mm -hmm. impressive too. So I thought this was going to be a pretty tight matchup. First 30 seconds, Vela gets a wide open shot. And I was like, oh shit, this this could get crazy. The energy... The energy at BMO Field was ridiculous, but it's something we're getting used to at LAFC home matches, man, because they really know how to build up that home type of energy. 
the rest of the game really was just Houston getting on the ball a lot, but not moving the ball quick enough. I thought Carrasquilla, Herrera, and Arthur have been immense this entire season, but they could not handle the midfield press of LA. They couldn't handle it. Ilya Sanchez, Tillman, and Kellen Acosta hounded every single Houston player for the entire match. They didn't let them breathe. Buwang and Vela constantly making sure that the Houston that the Houston backline only had the ball for maximum two seconds. Mm-hmm. They had to release mm-hmm. it. And then the backline, Hollingshead was immense. Palacios, so good. Chiellini was a fucking rock at the back. Houston couldn't break him. Mm-mm. They could not find a way to do it. And then in transition, that's where LA really shined with Buwanga on the wing or maybe Oliveira too. Um, what has really impressed me about LAFC this whole postseason is that unlike last year, they're completely relying on their defense to win them games. Last year was all about offense, completely. For me, this year, LA have actually won their big, big games with their defense. And I think that's the biggest difference between last year's winning version versus this year's. And it, it's really interesting, though, because is it going to work out against a very talented Columbus Crew side? I'm actually not so sure. I think their defense will definitely be able to contain Columbus, but I think LA don't have the same fluidity that they have last year, not when they go forward. But if they have the same type of defensive pressure, I think it's going to be a tight game nonetheless when they do play Columbus in Ohio. In, in Ohio. Man, how about that matchup, dude? That, that's going to be... That matchup's going to be insane, man. Insane to see LAFC travel to Columbus to play in an MLS Cup final, looking for their second MLS Cup in a row. The stakes cannot be higher. For Columbus crew, man... I, I'm so impressed by their ability when faced with adversity. It happened the Orlando City match as well, where it was tied for a very long time, and then finally in the last 10 minutes, they were they were able to break the deadlock and take the lead. They're able to play a complete 90 minutes, which I think deserves a lot of credit. For LAFC, what does scare me, though, is just the, I, I guess the, the ability that so many of their players can reach, skill, talent, and, and impact-wise. When they're on it, and when they're all feeling themselves, and if the midfield is playing as good as they just did, they're essentially unstoppable, bro, because up front, it's the it's probably the best front three that you have right now in the MLS, and then behind them, you have a really good defensive line that can cover for them if they make any mistakes. So it makes for a really tough matchup or a really tough opponent to beat. I'm going to go Columbus Crew, though. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go Columbus Crew. I think that when it comes to the team finally taking down this LEFC side that, that is going through a golden era right now in the MLS, it would take a team like this Columbus Crew side who is a crew, who is a group of men that band together and play wonderful football. I think as a team, they have that cohesion. They have a good leader in Wilfred Nancy that I think can game plan for LEFC very well. And then you have players that are in form right now. Gucho Hernandez, Cristian Ramirez, I think have been incredible so far. And you have threats all across the field that I think can counter LAFC in a way that Houston Dynamo couldn't. And so style-wise, I actually think Columbus Crew fits better in this matchup against LA. I'm just saying, though, I won't be surprised at all if that LAFC championship grit just comes into play and they find a win them and they find a way to win this match because that is what they are, bro. They're winners. And that is why I essentially picked them to go this far in the tournament. Yeah, no, I actually completely agree. I have Columbus Crew lifting the 2023 MLS Cup. Won't be surprised if LA do it. They literally just did it last year. To be back-to-back champions would be insane, though. Mm-hmm. That'd be so, so impressive. They can do it. My only thing is, is that I just think Columbus Crew have too many offensive threats. LAFC are a little bit one-dimensional going forward. It really is just Buwanga. Vela, I think for the first time, doesn't look to be in great, great form. Uh, he's been so good for LA. Uh, there was a beautiful moment against Houston where they took him off like with like 25 minutes to go, oh, actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, pretty early. Yeah. But that, that's the thing, bro. Like, back a year ago, Vela plays the entire 90. Not anymore. And, and I think it is because of his form. But still, LAFC fans, standing yeah. ovation for him. And he's, he's been so, so good for LA for so long. But I do think he's finally he's reaching, he's, yeah. re- he's reaching that max that's that maximum limit and i do think he's dropped in form which is only going to hurt la against a very good columbus crew again buwanga's too isolated for me and Oliveira doesn't do much to be honest he's really active but he's not clinical and la wins this game 
if their midfield shows up defensively and their back line shows up defensively. But Columbus Crew win this game if they just apply offensive pressure. And I think statistically, that's more likely to happen. Mm. So I'm going Columbus Crew as the winner. And they're at home too, man. And they're at home. home. Overall, crazy, crazy matchup that we have between LAFC and Columbus Crew this weekend. Let's find out who is going to be the MLS champion. The other major news in La Liga in Spain was Girona coming back after being down to Valencia 1-0. Cristian Stuani comes in around the 81st minute and within six minutes scores a brace to guide Girona on an incredible comeback to continue their Leicester City type run so far in La Liga and maintain a second slot in the table absolute scenes magical stuff happening so far even if the rest of the season doesn't pan out for them what they've done already i think has been so impressive from a girona perspective that you just got to appreciate every single one of these moments and the fact that it was one of their old heads one of their old timers and Cristian Stuani that was able to that was able to play an impactful role in this comeback i think makes it just even more sweet it's remarkable that girona virtually only win they don't draw they rarely lose they are winning Every single game that is put in front of them, it's absolutely incredible. But but I need this to continue. I need more, man. You, you said you'd be happy if it ends now. I actually want a little bit more January. January is going to be a big, big month for Girona. Can they go post-Christmas break, post-going into the new year, and maintain this level of play? The way it's looking... I think they I think they can bro because pretty no matter who they face they are very adaptable they maintain their style of play and so far it's only getting them wins. Yeah, I'm curious though because uh, yeah, that's that's been true for everybody except the top teams. They got killed by Real Madrid. They got killed by Madrid. And they haven't played Atletico yet. But next week we get that beautiful matchup between a Barca team that just beat Atletico and played one of their best halves so far, and Girona, who just came back from this incredible victory. Girona, Girona Barcelona going to be an incredible matchup to watch for next week. If they can win that game or even get points out of it, I think that's something we're keeping an eye on, but it's exactly what they need to be able to do something monumental and in January and for the rest of the season. So yes, big, big game. Keep an eye on it. Heading on over to Saudi Arabia real quick, if you don't mind going with me. Two massive teams, the two biggest teams in the region. Al Halal faced off against Al Nasser. My AFC Champions League pick versus your AFC Champions League pick Mm -hmm. going head to head in the Al Halal Stadium. The Blue Jewel was in full effect with so many people in the stadium. Absolutely packed to a brim. It was a sea of blue, brother. It looked like a moving ocean. And we saw absolute scenes with Al Halal winning not one. Not two, but three nil against Cristiano Ronaldo's Al Nasser. With this victory, Al Hilal is now seven points clear up top after 15 games. And so far, they're looking like the favorites to lift the trophy. But huge, huge result huge. in both the league. But then I also think it says a little bit about what could come to happen in the AFC Champions League if these two teams ever have to face off against each other. For sure. Wow. I didn't see the game, but what a enormous result. Mm-hmm. Three zero. Three. It was tight, though. It was tight. And I think uh, it was Milinkovic Savic that broke the deadlock at mm-hmm. around like the 70th minute. Okay. And then Mitrovic got two goals after 90 minutes. So okay. it really was like a 1-0 type of result, I would say. It was very, very tight. Mm. But I really didn't see Al Nasser do much in this game, honestly. Maybe they were just a little off. But Al Hilal was feeling themselves, nice. and they showed it on the day. Yeah, congratulations, Al Hilal. Huge win. PSV Eidhoma, who was at the top of the table going into this game, faced off against second place Feyenoord. Former champions, Feyenoord. Former too. champions. PSV, a team that right now, up to this point, had 13 wins in a row. And by many, I would say, are, is being considered as possibly one of the greatest at the Vizzy sides to ever come into effect if they can continue this streak. I mean, it's been incredible. Not a single tie, not a single loss so far. Wow, yeah. It's incredible, That's incredible. the incredible. record, bro. And they showed up, bro. They showed up once again, taking a 2-0 lead in this match, controlling it overall. Santi Jimenez got a goal in this game once again to get his 17th goal of the campaign. The game ends 2-1. But to me, PSV was the better team in this match. And now, PSV just looks in complete control of becoming eventual Eredivisie champions after their 14th straight win. They're now at 42 points already in the season. And I looked into it because I really was asking myself, 
could this be the greatest in a division side of all time if they continue? Well, here are the two greatest teams so far. It's actually tied. Both teams got 88 points in the league. And the first one was Ajax in 2020-2021 season. So recently, mm -hmm. 28 wins, four draws, two losses, and a plus 79 goal differential. <laughs> hey, 79. God, dude. 79. That Dutch defense, good brother. Lord. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, we know that. 88 <laughs> points total. Total. And then the second contender is PSV, who also amassed 88 points in the 2014-2015 season with 29 wins, one draw, four losses, and a plus 61 goal differential. So that's the goal. PSV is almost halfway there halfway to 88, there. and they have a shot here if they can continue this pace. It's just incredible so far, but mm -hmm. you have really good talents. Pepe, Chucky, Des, CONCACAF talents in this team, but then Luke de Jong, who's a Dutch I mean, when he's in the Dutch league, he's a completely different player. He's yeah. clinical. He's a killer. You have so many players on this team. Bakayoko, who's so electric on the wings, that I, I think could could continue this rate of winning if they can just maintain that Eredivisie confidence and see themselves winning more matches. So keep an eye on that to see how they perform throughout the rest of the season. Dortmund tied by Leverkusen, one-one. Is the title race over? <laughs> What does the table look like? I'm famously not watching. Oh uh, God, this actually, year. it's not that bad, man. Leverkusen still unbeaten in all competitions. I just want to point that out. Victor Boniface getting the game time goal in this match. Eight goals, five assists so far in the Bundesliga. He's looking okay. really good. Here's how the table looking right now. In first place with 13 games played, Leverkusen has 35. Bayern Munich has a game in hand. They have 32. So they win, they'll be tied. Yeah, okay. Uh, third place, Stuttgart with 30 points. Right. And then you have Leip Leipzig in fourth with 26, Dortmund in fifth with 25, and then there's a five-point uh, drop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, classic Dortmund there. That's mm -hmm. really interesting. But Stuttgart, Leverkusen right there? St That's Stuttgart, Leverkusen great. right there, at least putting on that pressure. I think you gave a number early on in the season about when you're going to actually take this serious. And so I will not bring up this topic until that number <laughs> arrives. And I have yeah. been checking on it every single week. Yeah, for sure. And then real quick, just wanted to go over some Premier League results that happened this yeah, week. Yeah, for sure. I mean, oh God! I mean, to you, which one was the one that stood out the most? What I what stood out was the City Tottenham three three. Yeah, the last two goals, Manchester City taking three two lead and then conceding once again three three. Dude, there was a bizarre play in this match that's being talked about, where Erling Holland, uh, it's the game's tied three three three. Erling Holland brings the ball down. He's in the middle of the pitch, gets fouled in the process, but continues his push towards the ball he gets up he gets back towards the ball and he finds a wide open jack grealish on the run to eventually be on a breakaway one-on-one -on -one with the goalkeeper potentially game tying game winning opportunity here but in the process the ref is seen allowing holland to continue playing on because he was about to blow the whistle when he got fouled but then once holland sent the pass he goes back and reverts and decides to blow the whistle so he gave the idea to Holland that he was going to allow him to keep playing on, give him the advantage. But then once the pass was made, the ref just completely, I don't know, had a mental block. I don't know what happened. Called the playoff and City was furious. Never seen Holland that mad. Never seen him that mad. Showing all sorts of emotion on the pitch. Screaming curse words at the, at the referee. Really bizarre play. The opportunity itself was... Golden. Was golden. It's golden. Was golden. It yeah. was not ultimately allowed. I'd be fucking furious <sighs> if I was going Man. for Manchester City. Yeah. Really, really interesting situation that you don't see often, but it's the same ref from the Liverpool Tottenham game. <laughs> same ref. I'm just I'm gonna say. <laughs> you know what you know what it is? And it, it's the same error that was made famous with the VAR thing that happened like what a month or a month and a half ago. I think the Premier League is so high stakes that even the refs feel it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think probably what happened here is the ref, in the moment, actually forgot who fouled who. <laughs> I've seen it before. It's really interesting where they're like, oh, I'm gonna play this on, but they're like, wait, the Tottenham player fouled here. And then he realizes, wait a second, I'm actually calling for Manchester City. Yep. But he has to mask it all and be like, I'm bringing it back. This, ha it's this, crazy. Ha this happens in really high pressure situations. And that that's what's crazy is that I think the Premier League is just so high intensity that the refs are probably nervous to make any big call. Yeah, so they almost like overthink their, their, they overthink their calls. Bro. Yeah, I, yeah. I, would, 
I could I, I actually not to defend the ref. I could see that being the reason, yeah. something like that, because you know that there's a magnifying glass on the Premier League specifically, specifically. when it comes to the refs. Specifically, and you, we know how the English do under pressure, brother. We know how they do. <laughs> <laughs> it gets really, really tough, bro. They start tough, sweating, dude. They start sweating, and I think that's kind of what might have happened today, and why we see so many questionable results. But regardless, three three, an insane shootout here. I looked into the last 10 Premier League games between both these sides because for me, the biggest takeaway is just how every single time Tottenham knows how to play up to Manchester City. Mm. No matter what state they're in, yeah. no matter what players they're missing, what their form is in, they somehow find a way to play against the best team in the world and match up to their level. In the last 10 Premier League games, Manchester City only has three wins, two draws, and five losses against Tottenham, dude. They've lost more games than they've actually won wow. against Tottenham specifically. Yeah. That's crazy. Almost a little bit of of the of, uh, kryptonite here yeah, for me for because sure. three wins here. out of 10 for Manchester City is completely unheard of. Wow, I wonder if there's any other Premier League clubs that have a record like that against City or is it just Tottenham, I wonder? I, I mean, the only other contender would have to be Liverpool. Yeah. But I, even then, I mean, I, I think in the last 10 specifically Premier League matches, right. I think it's going to be Tottenham that has the best uh, record. Very impressive. Yeah. L Liverpool got a crazy result, though, this weekend crazy. too, right? Did you happen to see the goals by any chance, bro? I saw the goals, like, you know, through TikTok. <laughs> Bro, I saw four Puskas nominees is what I saw. Mm. Crazy goal after goal after goal after goal. I cannot remember the last time that I saw four goals of that high of quality, especially headlined by Alexis McAllister's insane, insane volley, dude. Ridiculous. It's tough to really describe these goals. I'm not even going to get into it. If you have not seen the highlights of that game, check him out. This was, this was Barclays Premier League. That's what we saw. We saw vintage <laughs> Premier League here with the emotions, with the goals, with the quality on the pitch. Finally capped off with Trent Alexander-Arnold just scoring an absolute banger of a goal to give Liverpool the lead. And then he goes swimming in that corner, man. Swimming in that corner. And so does the rest of the team to just celebrate and put on some absolute scenes at Anfield. Liverpool gets a 4-3 win. And it's the only positive that happened this whole fucking weekend, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For 100%. But congratulations to your, be your beautiful, beautiful Liverpool. With you. An insane win. And, and I, I'll t to get, if, if I can take a little bit more credit here, yeah. I also did get one more mini win. Because we had we had the battle of the Uniteds, Manchester United. Oh, who won that? Newcastle one? United. Who got that one? We all know how we've been talking about both these teams this whole season. Both these teams has caused us a lot of frustration, man. Both of us has both these teams have caused us to drink way too much this season already. And it was Newcastle United who came out on top behind Anthony Gordon's goal here to win 1-0 in a game that I think overall was dominated by Newcastle. And we just saw a bad, we saw a bad Manchester United side once again. Yeah, one, yeah, one, once one again. Zero. Let's make that really clear here. Mm -hmm. United just can't figure it out. They can beat opponents that are inferior to them, but as soon as their opponent matches them, they become the weaker opponent and yeah. more often than not lose. Newcastle outside of the Champions League have kind of started to get a little bit better results in the Prem, which is good. And that's what United just cannot do is no matter who they play, they cannot figure it out when they need to. So a really good result then for Newcastle to at least maintain some sort of positive progress. Yeah, yeah. and hey, I just want to point out on my solo show, I made a point to say that I think Anthony Gordon is Newcastle United's best player so far this season. And I don't think he's been getting his flowers because he got heavily criticized when you attach that 40 million euro price tag to him. But his numbers so far in the Prem have been incredible. He's actually lived up to that price, in my opinion. And he's been their best offensive player so far, surprisingly, on, in that wing position. So for me, it's just another sign of how important he has been to this team and that he can continue that run of form that he's in right now to be able to give him the lead over Manchester United. Yeah, I think the only, the only it, it's unfortunate, but the problem with, I think, Gordon not getting his flowers this season is that Newcastle have been really, really inconsistent. And the thing is, when Newcastle is having a bad game, he tends to also have a bad game. And I think that that little correlation there makes it a little bit harder to be like, oh, Gordon's having a hell of a season. Uh, and then not even that, last year when Newcastle were you know, flying really high. It was that interconnect between the entire front three that I think made them really shine. And since Gordon's kind of like the only one doing it, it's not as exciting 
when Newcastle get a goal or two. So I think that's it. It's completely unfortunate, but yeah, Gordon's having a really good yeah. season. And lastly, uh, Germany beats France in penalties. U seventeen. I saw. I saw. I got just the penalties, but yeah, I, I wasn't I able see to see game, shit, man. man. Because I tried to look up highlights, I couldn't find shit, man. <laughs> There's nothing out there, bro. I was like, fuck. I guess I missed it. Then I should have been up at six in the fucking morning yeah. to watch this game. Germany wins. Congratulations to you, Germany's uh, youth development program. I guess. <laughs> I guess. Man. Three three, right? Three it was like a three. Shootout, apparently. Yeah. 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 Three, I, I, three. I wonder how the goals were, and I wonder like who dictated the game. Yeah. I, I have no idea. Three three. But congratulations, congratulations. to U seventeen Germany. <laughs> man.